Welcome to the session on staying a step ahead of cybercriminals, the university's role in cybersecurity research and development. My name is Manfred Minimeyer. I'm one of the organizers of the conference and a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at Seton Hall University. I'm excited to introduce to you some very well-known researchers in the cybersecurity field. First, Dr. Josiah Dijkstra, who is technical fellow at the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center at the NSA, will speak on getting started with cybersecurity science. Then, Dr. Susanne Wetzel, who is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Stevens Institute of Technology, will speak on bridging cybersecurity research and education. Afterwards, Professor Dr. Kurt Roloff, who is director of the Cybersecurity Research Center at New Jersey Institute of Technology and CTO at Duality Technologies, will moderate the Q&A panel for the speakers. If you have any questions for our speakers, please submit them in the chat box such that the panel can cover them. So let's get started. Good morning, everybody. This is Josiah Dykstra. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I am joining you from Maryland, so not terribly far away, and I'm sorry that uh, we weren't able to do this in person, um, but hopefully everybody enjoys um, the session virtually as well. I am gotten very comfortable and used to these environments and uh, happy to engage with you during this session, uh, during the Q&A, and also by email. I'll share that at the very end of my slides. I have a very short time uh, that I want to share a lot of information with you. Um, this is based on a book that I wrote and a passion that I have for bringing more cybersecurity, si bringing more science into the practice of cybersecurity. So I am a government employee. I'm going to talk about some products. They are not uh, necessarily endorsements by me or the government. So just a very short 30 seconds about where I came from. My PhD is in computer science. My dissertation was looking at uh, cloud forensics. How do you investigate crimes that happen in remote cloud environments? I've had uh, a professional career that spans both research and practice, about seven and a half years of both. And I came to really appreciate the need for more science in cybersecurity, and that led me to be a very vocal advocate. NSA sponsors a program called the Science of Security. Uh, you can find that online, where they actually give universities money to help study this problem. Simultaneously, I wrote this O'Reilly book um, that is very much meant for practitioners who just haven't had a lot of scientific training. I, when I wrote the book, the last science class I had was probably in the second grade or third grade of elementary school. And it occurred to me that so much of cybersecurity could be better, and we'll talk about what that means, um, just with a little science. That doesn't have to mean a five-year research program. It could be a five-minute experiment this afternoon. I will also say that uh, my publications there on my website cover quite a span of things, um, from how to use music, uh, sonification in cybersecurity, to the human aspect of cybersecurity, which I've grown very, very passionate about. So this talk is very much meant for all audiences, whether you're a student, a faculty member, a practitioner in the field already, um, science can be part of all of your lives and jobs. Um, we tend to think of it as something that happens in an ivory tower or somebody wearing a white lab coat um, but it's not that cut and dry. I think there's a lot of lessons here for everybody in the field, and it can make us all better, no matter sort of how, what, what our job is, because the outcomes we want are the same. We want safe users, we want safe environments, and that's what I'm sort of help, here to, to help illustrate. If, however, you have not worked in the field before, let me give you a sneak peek. This is one of the environments at the NSA. This is the 24 hour, seven day a week Cyber Operations Center. This is where we watch for intrusions against the Department of Defense. This is a network of 3 million people. This is a very large organization, um, and it takes a, much more than just this op center to, to do that job. But this is a typical environment, even at companies like Facebook and Google and internet service providers, to watch for threats. It takes a lot of people, it takes a big team, and 
Um, some of these centers, including ours, very much look like this, something you might see in a movie. And visitors love to come visit the center, but it is very much there to help us with productivity. So I I'm going to try and convince you that science is important in cybersecurity for at least a couple of reasons. Not only is it respected, um, but it's a way for people like you and me to explore our curiosity. The reason I got into computer science was it was interesting. I, I wanted to know how did the computer work? How did these programs between my phone and a server communicate information? Um, how is it that possibly somebody can build a light bulb that is controlled over the internet? Um, I just wanted to know how things worked. Um, and lots of people who go into this field, this is an outlet for that creativity. But then even farther, once we sort of understand how things work and we can build interesting stuff, how do we make it better? Right? If you're going to implement cryptography uh, to secure data on a device, well, should you choose algorithm A or B? And how do you decide which one is more secure? What does secure even mean? Right? And so the ability to make easier products to use that are safer for people that allow them to do their jobs, that's another reason to do science. I'll also admit that one reason I like cybersecurity is that it's difficult. I, I get bored very easily by trivial problems, but computer science and the technology, that changes all the time, every day, right? A new product comes out. And the fact that it is a difficult problem is actually very attractive to me. And so if you're wondering whether this is the right fit for you, consider that as well. And then the stereotypical reason that we all do science is that it advances the body of knowledge. There are things the world doesn't yet know about quantum computing and about next generation cryptography. And so the advancement of knowledge, the ability to contribute to brand new things that nobody has ever done before, that's really exciting and, and another reason to do it. So of course, if you believe that it's, it's a good thing to do, when in our lives uh, is this sort of an appropriate methodology to apply? And I would say, almost always. <laughs> um, if you in the back of your brain are sort of wondering, I wonder why some my company made this choice. Or I wonder what if we built the software a different way. Those are all reasons to do experimentation. So whether you are in charge of looking at intrusions on a network or you write forensic tools or you're in charge of procuring, purchasing antivirus for your company, these are all sort of opportunities to ask questions about what part of the scientific method was used to create that? Do I believe what somebody's telling me? Um, and how can I make better products? Like I mentioned uh, in the beginning, cybersecurity research is not just done at universities. I think people largely are unaware how much science goes on in industry. And just some very brief, easy to, to understand examples from Microsoft and Google and Symantec, they all have substantial research organizations and they sit the researchers right next to practitioners to build stuff that really shows up on your phone or on your computer that makes real people's lives better. And if you like that kind of applied research, industries are a phenomenal place to do that. NSA similarly has a very large research organization because we understand we need to learn how to do our jobs better. Uh, the defense of the nation relies on it. And so we hire hundreds of people with PhDs in math and computer science and physics uh, to learn how to do national security, cybersecurity better. I cannot footstomp enough uh, how long it took me to realize that people matter in cybersecurity. The reason we have this as a field is that there are attackers trying to take over your computer or steal your data um, if that wasn't a problem, we might not need cybersecurity, but in fact we do. And it's easy to think of humans only in the user role, right? We hear this adage, the user is the weakest link, which I think is the worst phrase ever, uh, because I don't think we should blame users uh, for being human. But in fact, humans play lots of roles in cybersecurity, right? The people who develop software also make human mistakes very obviously, right? But we neglect sometimes to think about the people trying to attack us, right? Those adversaries are also subject to hunger and fatigue and cognitive bias, right? They are deciding whether to attack computer A or B. And there's a really an interesting emerging field about deception in cybersecurity. How can we take advantage of the humanness of our adversaries 
for the defense of our own systems. And this dates back to honeypots and things like that. And these days, this kind of deception is even more sort of rich and interesting. I'm happy to point you to more uh, research there. So whether you're curious about how to make more usable stuff or deceive adversaries, um, if you want to build a recommendation system, one thing I could really use in cybersecurity is a system that would tell me for all the hundreds of alerts that went off in my antivirus or in my intrusion detection system, which one is the most important? What should I consider doing first? Not that I want the machine to decide for me today. I don't think we're quite that robust yet. Um, but recommendations can help humans do their jobs better. So lots of great research areas there. As I said, let's take just 30 seconds to remind ourselves of what the scientific method actually is. It is quite simple, right? Five easy steps about observing the world, making a hypothesis about how you think something might work, developing a prediction, running an experiment, and then analyzing the data to decide, do I have evidence to accept the hypothesis that I started with? And like I said, that doesn't have to be a long, arduous process, although many times it is in research. It can be something as, as trivial as troubleshooting sort of a problem with your program. In addition to those five steps, uh, we ought not forget about the sort of principles of science. And these aren't manifested necessarily as a step in the process, but a state of mind. So the fact that we need to be objective about our analysis is a principle, right? We cannot just look at the data that supports uh, the hypothesis that we, the conclusion that we want and eliminate all the other data that would otherwise contradict it. We need to be objective in our work. Falsifiability is a very interesting one and actually one that a computer scientist at Microsoft, Cormac Hurley, has suggested is particularly difficult in cybersecurity. And Hurley said, asked the question, is computer security a pseudoscience? And he, what he means by that is sometimes it is not possible to prove a statement false. And here's the, the rub we sort of get into in cybersecurity. We make claims, vendors make claims all the time that if you don't implement this protection, you are not secure. That statement is not falsifiable. Um, and so to those kinds of questions, it appears rather difficult to enforce the scientific method. Now, I still think computer security is important research to do. Um, I think there is there are falsifiable claims, um, but it is an interesting thing to think about in this field, about whether or not we have this, this um, principle of science. Another I like to highlight in this discussion is what practitioners call scientific rigor. And what this means is this picture. Did you color inside the box, inside the confines of the scientific method? And sometimes it's very, very important to be very rigorous about your research, and sometimes it matters less. I think it matters in the cases where life is at stake, whether that's medical research or military applications, um, and sometimes if it's just trying to troubleshoot, how do I make an internet connected toaster? Um, perhaps uh, it's less important to color inside the box. But when you hear people talk about scientific rigor, that's what they mean. Many people I talk to, particularly in academia, particularly students who are new to this field, don't have a good sense about how to start. They don't know what subject to pick. Um, and what I ask them to do is just kind of think about your everyday life. What have you encountered that you are frustrated with or you're curious about? And that leads us to questions that are worth investigating. The worst thing that can happen is we do a research study and, and all the, the other scientists in the world say, we don't care. That's probably a much worse outcome than a paper getting rejected from a, from a journal, is them just to say, this doesn't matter. And so in the beginning, we want to find a research question that's worth investigating. Um, that leads us to, to those kinds of questions. And so that gets to the sort of so what. And when I'm thinking about new research topics, when I'm going to a conference and talking with others, these are the way that I formulate those statements, which is for, ex this is just a, an example that I've studied in the past. I would like to understand who makes risky decisions online, who opens spear phishing emails, who visits those shady websites. Why? 
because I want to find out if we can predict future victims, can we help more people be safe by understanding the risky people and the choices they make? Why? In order to help us protect people from exploitation. So I keep asking myself, why, why, why? And when you have a question like this, the first thing to do is sort of develop your elevator pitch. If you need to tell to describe your research statement in one minute, can you do that? It turns out to be very difficult and something we all kind of have to practice. I also want you to have a five minute spiel about your research and a 15 minute spiel, but to consolidate and be able to clearly articulate, what are you working on right now? In sort of a one minute conversation, that takes some expertise, it takes some practice, uh, but it turns out to be a very valuable skill in research. Now you can take whole college courses and buy whole textbooks about research methods. Um, there is a broad way to do this. There are different types of research for different types of questions. It is not that one is better than another. It is not that one is wrong or incorrect, um, but it's, it's necessary to understand not only when you're conducting research, but when you're reading about it. When you read a research paper, what was the methodology they used? And what does that say about the results that they found? Now, I will tell you, I talk to people all the time, even in my everyday life, uh, who ask perhaps the wrong question. I've had many bosses in my life uh, who say, can you build me, for example, a sandbox, uh, an environment to analyze 10,000 pieces of malware every minute? Well, that's a yes or no question. That isn't actually a hypothesis, but we can reframe it for them. We can turn it into a scientifically exploratory question with things like, if I have 30 servers, can I analyze 10,000 files in five minutes, right? We can actually do an experiment to test that. And maybe you find evidence that it's true and maybe you don't. Now, that's not just an academic question. Um, it turns out to be a real world interesting question. Uh, for people who have to analyze a lot of malware, that question matters a lot. And in the DARPA Cybergram Challenge, that was an interesting question that wasn't at the forefront of this competition. But the people who created the competition had to figure out how are we going to judge the results? And they wrote a very interesting paper about how to run a cyber competition. Um, and one of the things they wrestled with was, how can we keep up with scoring the competition? I thought that was sort of an interesting anecdote. The other principle I'll point out here, sort of as one <clears> of my <throat> last ones, is what's called ecologic validity. And that is, does your research uh, inform or does it mimic the real world? And the easiest way to understand this is with an analogy, right? If you were, if you wanted to study gorillas, you could go out to the jungle, to real gorillas in a real environment, and that might be dangerous, it might be expensive, but you get the most realistic situation. Alternatively, you could study gorillas in a zoo, you could even study gorillas in a cage, but that spectrum of environments matters a lot. And how that manifests in cybersecurity is, if you're going to study malware, for example, it is very dangerous, probably illegal to study it by running it on the internet, even though that would be a realistic situation. But if you want to monitor the takedown of botnets, um, some of those happened this week, uh, looking at the real world gives you much more ecologically valid results than if you were just doing those results on your laptop or even by not running them with static analysis at all. So again, none of these three environments are wrong or right, but it matters in how you conduct the research. And it's something that not everybody thinks about in the beginning. I will say that science is not a checklist. And even though this slide has that in quotations, um, I have developed over time things for researchers to think about, which is, have you followed the methodology of the scientific method? Have you considered whether you need to protect humans in your research with human subjects review? Um, it's meant to just help be a reminder, and you can go to that website and you can get a copy of that, which is excer excerpted from the book. Um, again, it's not that you will do amazing science if you tick all the boxes, but just things to think about. So as I sort of conclude my remarks, I, I think it's important to remember that science does help cybersecurity. There's a real practical need for it, um, in addition to expanding the body of knowledge. The outcomes that I'm looking for are more secure products, more secure people who can do their primary jobs. Security is no business's primary job other than the security industry. 
But if your job is an attorney or you sell flowers in a florist shop, you have a primary job and security is there to help you do that primary job. Um, refresh yourself about the scientific method if you haven't thought about it in a while. Um, it is very approachable and easy to do. And don't forget the humans. Uh, they matter a lot. There's a lot of interesting research there. But even if you are very passionate about building hardware, think about what kind of human mistakes uh, might happen, how the user might use that sort of the device you're building. Um, don't forget about the people. And with that, I will leave you my email address. Very happy to take questions during the panel or at any time uh, into the future. Thanks. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Dijkstra. That uh, has been very interesting. And um, I actually wanted to echo uh, these uh, research steps you, you laid out. Um, just recently, I uh, supervised some undergraduate research, uh, re research uh, project, and we uh, precisely went uh, through these steps as you outlined them in the scientific method. Now, uh, this project was about um, detecting intruders uh, in corporate networks. So it's about anomaly detection. Of course, if uh, somebody tries to break into some network, at some point something strange will go on and uh, we want to pick this up somehow. So uh, precisely in uh, this project, when I first uh, talked to student, uh, we didn't really know what uh, what to study or what, what should, be our pro should the problem be. So we had to decide this first. And then also we did a, a literature review uh, to see what uh, what's out there actually. And um, so um, that literature review was also very helpful uh, because it uh, pointed us to some uh, data sets we were able to use. Um, this I always uh, find uh, among the greatest uh, difficulties for cybersecurity research to find uh, valid and, and interesting and current uh, data sets. So uh, we could uh, see what's, what has been used in the literature and, and rely on, on those data sets. And uh, so then the student uh, developed some, uh, some machine learning methods. Um, he applied uh, neural networks and other kind of uh, classification uh, methods for machine learning uh, to detect uh, outliers and uh, uh, some uh, unusual activity. And uh, so, of course, like, like you said, we, we, had to, uh, we had to formulate a hypothesis and then, uh, then in, in the end uh, verify and analyze the result. So precisely these steps of the scientific uh, method. And um, uh, this project turned out to be very successful. Actually, the, the student was able to, to present a research poster just last week at, uh, at an IEEE uh, data science conference in Australia. Of course, it's, um, it's uh, a virtual conference, so he wasn't able to go, but uh, it was nevertheless a great experience. Now, now, my question for you, actually, since you are really immersed in this field as a practitioner, what, what should students do if they want to find new data sets where they and um, what's the best way to go about this? Yeah, that is remains a very um, challenging problem. Uh, and I will acknowledge it as much as anybody. In some sense, I think we're getting a little bit better because when people publish research now, they're either required or strongly encouraged to share not only their code, but their data. And so 10, 20 years ago, that was extraordinarily rare. Right. You just got to read the results and you couldn't replicate that study because the data wasn't available. Now it is much more prevalent. It doesn't solve the general problem and it presents some challenges in the fact that the data is sort of scattered all over the Internet. There's not one repository. The government perhaps has a role in this, right? If NSF, for example, sort of hosted a repository for data sets, that could help. Uh, that could enable a lot. NSF also could require that when they give grants, the people doing the research at the university produce a data set, right? They could help uh, solve this problem in that kind of way. Um, data sets are difficult in cybersecurity for lots of sort of obvious reasons, right? I don't want my personal credit card in that data set. 
Some companies don't even want their internal IP addresses in that data set. So another way that we've gotten better is in the anonymization of data sets. Um, the techniques for that are relatively robust. They were not as robust 10 or 20 years ago, but the ability to sanitize that data for sharing does exist. And so a company has a little less uh, to stand on now. Well, I can, the community can help overcome the sensitivity part. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, that's very interesting. Now, um, let me also introduce introduce uh, Dr. Roloff, uh, and uh, he is the director of the Cyber Security Research Center at New Jersey Institute of Technology, and also CTO at Duality Technologies. And uh, I th uh, so he has also prepared uh, some uh, discussion points. So uh, please, uh, Dr. Olaf, uh, continue. Gladly. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. So I'm going to, um, so as, as I was introduced, that um, I kind of have a dual role right now. Um, and uh, where I am a professor at NGIT, just down the road from Seton Hall. And I'm also CTO and co-founder of a cybersecurity tech, uh, company um, called Duality Technologies, which was basically co-founded out of some of the work that I've been doing for the past several years. Um, you know, Josiah, th thank you very much for this really, you know, really insightful earlier presentation. And I think actually my, mine hopefully will be an adequate bookend or sequel to uh, what you had presented earlier. Uh, discussing, you know, in some sense, almost a case study of several things that you discussed about the movement of, of research, the you know, the identification of research challenges from industry and government needs, uh, doing some sort of basic research, and then moving that basic research into uh, real world. And uh, you know, this is motivated partially by my career, where I spent earlier, um, uh, basically the first decade of my career working as a uh, proper card carrying defense contractor at one of the big prime, big prime defense companies. Um, you know, popped over to NGIT where I uh, built uh, several open source technologies, uh, which then is uh, formed the basis of, of duality technologies. And, and so this is, and, and actually end up selling back to the government also. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's full circle where, uh, you know, the, the or bus of uh, cybersecurity. So, like I said, uh, case study as we go. And so the underlying fear and vision that uh, is kind of motivating a lot of the thinking that we've had in, in this case study is this, uh, what I think is this really wonderful cartoon from the New Yorker. And, uh, you know, for those of you who, you know, have trouble seeing it, if you're on your phone or something like that, it's, it's a patient uh, getting interviewed by, by a doctor. And the quote says, uh, your previous provider refused to share your electronic medical records hey, don't worry, I, I was able to obtain all your information online. Um, so in some sense, this is a fear of, of, you know, having anyone be able to get access to one's private information. At the same time, it's also a vision because, you know, you want to get the right people to get the right information at the right time. And how, how can we make one maintain privacy, but also data access and, and balance these, these kinds of things. And this was uh, some work that was motivated by uh, some of the early work I was particularly doing for DARPA. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, DARPA is basically the blue sky R&D wing of the US military. Um, things like GPS and stealth and, and whatnot um, came out of that organization. Um, I happen to be in um, an organization called BBN where I shared an office or I was down the hallway from the gentleman who invented email and the people did the original ARPANET routers and became the internet routers. So this is a bit of a legacy of basic research for, for government that came out of there. And, you know, kind of the core of this case study was this discovery in, in roughly 2008, 2009, depending on who you talk to, uh, of this concept called homomorphic encryption or, or fully homomorphic encryption uh, through the actual publication of someone who was then a PhD student, uh, Craig Gentry. Um, and I think it's basically the most important computer science breakthrough of the, the 21st century uh, by far. And, and, you know, probably Craig will be a future Turing Award winner. Uh, but the concept of, of homework for encryption is, is, you know, pretty, pretty simplistic at some level. You have a, a data client, you know, it could be like a mobile phone, something like that. 
Uh, you have a data source. You know, this could be, for example, someone's tax files, someone's medical files, something like that. Um, you have a computation engine, and the client basically wants to have the data run uh, through a computation process at the host without the host actually being able to see what the information actually is, and so be able to maintain some sort of privacy. And so the you know the concept of homework for crypto is like I said fairly basic, and you can read the Wikipedia article about it if you want to, um, where you basically move a public key over to the data source, encrypt the data, you know, and and you know once data is encrypted, no one can touch it or anything, and, and move the computation host up, move the data up to the computation host, and then go and run computation over there, um, get an encrypted result. And then a crypto result is sent to the client who can then go and decrypt that and, and get uh, you know, basically the actual full result. And in some sense, it's a bit of black magic of, of running computation on the data. Um, and uh, you know, uh, when it was publicly announced, um, a lot of people tried to jump on it and, and try to see if they could actually do something with it. You know, at the time, it was basically a pile of uh, equations in the tech. And, uh, you know, there was a, a legacy of research that was going into how to actually try to make this real at some level. And where I got involved was one of the first DARPA projects for this, where I was running the implementation team to see if we could even actually make it run, let alone run efficiently. And you know, like I said, this, this notion of Homer for Crypto discovered in 2009, you know, you know, it's very kind of a strange thing, uh, but there were some really real practical computation challenges that were making it almost impossible to use that was engendering a lot of really interesting research challenges and, and, and engineering challenges about you know what do you need to do to make this thing fast is it a theoretical challenge is it implementation is it memory is it parallel compute um how do you deal with issues of cybertext about how cybertext gets so large as compared to you know the encrypted data which is cybertext gets so very large as compared to data in, in the clear and also it's a very very different compute model you know the analogy i like to use is that when we're, we're children, you know, we all have, you know, ten, most of us have 10 fingers and 10 toes. Um, and, and so we have base 10 hardware at birth natively. Um, you know, later in life, we get computing devices that have base two hardware. And uh, so we're learned in computer science school to go and do things like count by powers of two, you know, binary trees, because that's what's particularly efficient for the compute devices that we have. Um, homework for crypto is vastly different, where the underlying compute model is something that looks more like uh, uh, circuit evaluations. You, know, you have basically, you know, do any computation you want as long as you can make it from combinations of, of uh, convolution addition operations. And so it's a very different compute model. And how does one carry compute over from uh, uh, notionally like a Java or C++ program to run on homework for crypto? And so this this gets into the broader case study that uh, you know I want to kind of bring up about how we could do things like enable actual real ecosystems of computing on encrypted data for privacy preserving computation, whether it's for addressing government needs, whether it's for as a basic research project to 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 you know for people to basically get, generate PhDs, or for actually building a real business around it. And so the ecosystem that we had up was, you know, looking at various applications that were coming, for example, from NIH for genome-wide association studies and, and dualities commercial projects. My startup, we're, we're working in financial services for, uh, um, you know, uh, basically analysis of financial crime and anti-money laundering, or even Sloan Foundation, which was um, um, investing a lot of money, particularly for uh, social disparity issues and identifying uh, underserved populations that could be better served through through data access and you know beyond that software engineering we, we built a full-on open source library and that in itself is, is kind of its own little research project about how how one does software engineering to enable high assurance software through open source and it's a lot a lot harder than it might seem um, and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit and of course there's usability issues which came out of parts of the intelligence community about how do you actually make it easy to use? And then you know the core crypto of how do you design schemes? How do you uh, look at various kinds of configurations of uh, uh, security parameters and standardization? And then even how you look at things like uh, hardware to accelerate and, and make these things real. And, and all these various challenges, you know, basically grow out of this, this kind of simple concept of, hey, I, I've got this, this new, uh, encrypted compute model and what does it mean to actually make it real 
well, it's more than just writing a bunch of crypto papers. It's more than just writing a bunch of standalone code. It's more than um, uh, trying to apply it. it. It's everything and everything, and it is an ecosystem. And uh, if there are students or, or other researchers who are particularly interested in this field, uh, I'm more than happy to talk offline. Um, you know, one of the nice things, things about having a relatively unusual name like I do is that I'm pretty easy to fi find on Google. Um, so, like I said, you know, the notion of outsourced computing, and just to give a couple case studies of this about how one turns research research challenges into research and then into research product. Um, you know, there's a notion of outsourced computation and uh, you know, fully homomorphic encryption, you know, basically is pushing that forward. Um, and the core of this to what we're doing is, as I said, this open source library of Palisade, uh, which has been growing in, in various use cases inside the DoD and, and US government and, and various kind of mainline defense contractors like, like Lucent and Raytheon and things like that. And, you know, we, we are have software engineers employed at, at basically every layer, uh, looking at, for example, applications and, and, and how do one implement crypto, and how does one implement very low level math and, and accelerate the low level math at all types? Um, you know, for those of you that are interested in this, I'd encourage you to go to the, the Palisade website. We're actually uh, formally affiliated now as a formal project with the uh, NumFocus Consortium, which is the open source community that also manages NumPy and SciPy and Pandas and Scikit-learn and a few of these other various uh, data science and privacy libraries. Um, and uh, you know, Palisade in itself is designed to be both usable, but also to be a research platform in a real way, so that researchers can can research various lattice crypto schemes and other uh, systems issues associated with software engineering, and even look at hardware acceleration issues, which we're using. Um, you know, and and we've been very fortunate to have a community basically built out associated with uh, open source open source engagement and, and various. Uh, both contributors and sponsors across uh, academia, government, and, and industry. Um, and you know, kind of a, also an addendum to this is that research is not isolation. You know, we were not working on homework for crypto in an isolate. Um, homework for crypto standards has been something that's been growing quite a bit. And uh, as we work in the space, uh, we've been engaging with uh, other researchers, for example, Intel, IBM, Microsoft, and, and so forth who have been uh, um, engaging with us to uh, build up trust. And, and this is an also important aspect of, of research and research transition is the notion of how research is trusted, particularly in high assurance fields like cybersecurity. And, and we are particular fans of, of standardization and openness in this. And the notion of uh, a hacker working in isolation, I think is the wrong model for cybersecurity. It really is all about community and trust and, and going forward. And we see standardization as cryptos as being an exemplar of this. Um, you know, the example that we particularly use is these lattice-based crypto systems. Um, you know, for those who are interested in them, they're basically a family of relatively new um, encryption technologies. They're also among the, the leading candidates for the uh, NIST post-quantum crypto competition. Uh, so they do seem to be getting quite a uh, bit of traction associated with them. But like I said, I leave that as a, at least a placeholder for now for those of you who might be interested in the actual crypto schemes themselves. Um, and then there's no not, not work done by my group and not work done by uh, projects I've engaged with, but there has been a lot of work done by academics and, and academics in the US and other countries looking at security and crypto analysis. Um, and uh, you know what it actually means for for export compliance as we kind of engage with with you know the various I and ITAR and EAR regulations also. Um, and uh, you know I did mention how they has these post quantum properties too, um, which is of course another aspect of this about looking at you know alternative compute models and and how these these things might actually be broken or not. Um, you know, to get at some of this, the higher level software engineering and, and an aspect of research that we've been looking at and, and how this kind of fits into the, the broader sets of projects we've been running. You know, one of the major challenges of compute is, as you know, you have to take basically real data, messages, images, emails, things like that, uh, translate into things that are real, translate it into, into plain text, which could be encrypted, uh, compute, encrypt it, and then uh, run compute on those ciphertexts, then decrypt and decode. And, and every single one of these steps about how messages are encoded, how plain texts are encoded, the uh, how, how encryption is run, how encryption is implemented, 
how we'd run the sequence of operations to make it real. They're all part of this broader research challenge is to, to make it make it in some sense a real deal kind of thing. And uh, like I said, um, you know, getting at the broader ecosystem as we go, in addition to the notion of how we actually go and build uh, uh, programs that uh, map onto real compute devices so that it doesn't take a room full of PhD, crypto PhDs go and actually write a privacy preserving computation on this. Um, and, and like I said, just as a placeholder, we all have also been looking at hardware in the ecosystem about how you accelerate these things. Um, you know, this happens to be an older Vertex 10, Vertex 7 device, uh, which we were running for, for DARPA back in the day uh, about how to make accelerated subroutine calls for, for homework for encryption. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'll, I'll take this back to the sphere and this vision again before I close out at least the slides about the notion of what we're doing as enabling an ecosystem that is both, both to, you know, cybersecurity is inherently something that's supposed to be protective, but at the same time, it's supposed to be something that is enabling. And this is the balance we want to strike for these technologies, just in the case of homework for encryption, balancing the, uh, the needs of, of privacy, data sharing, data use, and security all at the same time. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at there for now. I know it's a bit of a whirlwind tour for something I've basically dedicated the past decade of my life to, but uh, happy to engage in questions and, and particularly the bigger picture of what this actually means of transitioning uh, project needs to research to uh, real world use. So thank you. I think you might be on mute, Manfred. Thank you. Uh, so I hope everybody can hear me now. Uh, Kurt, thank you very much uh, for, for this overview. It's a really very exciting uh, area of research. Now, um, uh, listening to your presentation, I've been wondering uh, what kind of uh, qualifications do you expect from uh, students uh, when they uh, want to do research in your institute? Uh, I can see that there's uh, uh, computational algebra involved, but uh, probably some computer science skills too. Uh, could you please uh, expand? Uh, what, uh, what should students know? Sure, and it, it varies quite a bit based upon uh, background and qualifications and, and interest. Uh, you know, as an example, my, my PhD is actually not in computer science. It's not even anything even related to cybersecurity. My, my PhD is actually in control engineering, um, which is where I had learned how to do embedded systems and high assurance embedded systems. Uh, I have another uh, uh, scientist, principal scientist that works with me who has a PhD in ocean engineering. You know, his background happens to be in signal processing, which, you know, knows how to implement math that runs really, really fast. Um, I have another PhD that works with me that has a PhD in uh, chemical engineering, and he just happens to be really, really good at math. Um, you know, the kind of the typical students I take, though, uh, tend to be, you know, for my group in particular, inherently, they have to be really, really good at implementing code, uh, whether it's low level embedded, you know, assembly language or higher level C, C++ for software engineering and, and software architecture. Um, we've also had people be very successful, both in my group and others, that were inherently more mathematicians that understand how to basically take math and, and wrap it into the needs of what would actually be needed for a crypto system. Uh, so basically, you know, a lot of the same skills that one would need for data science, uh, theory, it, you know, implementation, software engineering, generally carry over fairly well for what we do in at least our field of, of homework, applied homomorphic encryption. So thank you. Okay, thank you. That's um, uh, that's uh, very very interesting. Um, now, actually, I'd look. Uh, I'd like to ask the same uh, same question to uh, Josiah. Um, what uh, what should um, students uh, know as a background if they, for example, uh, uh, want to apply for an internship at NSA or or get into into the cybersecurity areas and want to work in the government? Yeah, this is a common question um, and a very good one. I, I will caveat first by saying I think there's a need for everybody in cybersecurity. There are a lot of jobs, uh, some of which need high school diplomas and some of which need PhDs and everything in between. Um, we tend to look for people particularly in 
the STEM fields uh, for cybersecurity, like computer science and engineering, mathematics. Um, but I would say there's also a role for non-STEM people in this field. The next person I would like to hire in my office, to be perfectly frank with you, is an economist. Because I think cybersecurity has a lot to do with value that people in economics understand better than me. I never had to take a class in economics. I never took a class in psychology. Um, and so even if you're a computer science major, your resume will stand out to me if you have a little bit of breadth, right? If you've taken one class in psychology or you've done even an independent research project. So the fundamental classes we all take, like operating systems and compilers and networking, very valuable. We will build on all of those things. But on very few days in my life do I actually do exactly what I learned in class, right? That is all sort of applied to new tools and new techniques um, that you just learn through experience. So more than anything, what I want to know is, can you learn new things and are you a creative thinker? And that's very difficult for employers to figure out about you, but it is perhaps um, arguably more important than do you know all of the computer science? Because I need you to learn new stuff and I need you to be creative. So those are also very valuable. We have approximately 10 minutes left in the session, so if there are any questions from the audience, feel free to use the Q&A. Uh, otherwise, we do have, uh, we have four great panelists here. So um, actually, um, let me also ask uh, an, a question to Professor Wetzel, who is uh, a professor at uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, and uh, she is also a cybersecurity researcher, of course. So uh, when you work with uh, students, um, what's, um, what are your expectations about the uh, skills and uh, also uh, other background the, the students uh, should have? Um, I think the most important thing for the research part is the curiosity and really the willingness to engage in, in, um, in some activities that are very different from what the students typically do in a class where they uh, literally have the professor present their materials, uh, they they kind of have exams or homeworks or questions presented to them where we typically have um, an answer to that already and the answer is worked out and we can provide it back to the students. And uh, so what I mean by this is that we kind of go into uncharted water and, and uh, the students need to be willing to take this on as a challenge and I think it's something completely new for them to learn as a skill um, that they will have to work in an area and that they will have to carry out tasks and they will have to try to figure out a solution to a problem and in a context where not even the professor has the answer to. And so to be willing to go on this kind of a path and really try this out is, is something that I'm looking for in the students and the students need to, you know, again, be willing to do this and carry this through with you as, 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 as an advisor. OK, that's uh, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, so I think um, a common view is uh, this uh, curiosity and uh, having uh, this uh, mind to do research, uh, really the desire to do, to do research. Um, I see. Now, maybe a question uh, to to everybody. 
um, if uh, if you if somebody wants to become a researcher in in cybersecurity, is it necessary to to have an undergraduate or a master's degree in a specific cybersecurity program, or is it uh, still possible uh, to just transis transition from a uh, say under uh, undergraduate computer science degree or a master's degree in, in applied math mathematics into cybersecurity research. Uh, do you think there are big differences? Maybe let me start with uh, with um, uh, Kurt. Yeah, surely. Um you know, fr frankly, what we've seen in um, NJIT and what I've seen in my career is that um, you know, it's like this old kind of uh, line that uh, Americans like to use is that you can't keep a good person down, as they say. Um, and uh, I I've, in the program that we run for cybersecurity masters at, at NJIT, uh, we've had successful candidates that come in from, from all fields. I mean, you know, obviously there's an affinity for people coming from computer science, IT, electrical engineering, and fields like that. But uh, I've had very successful students that have come from mechanical engineering, from uh, chemical engineering. Um, I even got, uh, you know, we have uh, also people that regularly come from the military who were more, um, you know, combined arms, you know, artillery, infantry backgrounds who come and decide they want to do cybersecurity who are quite successful. Um, and so for us, it's, uh, then uh, you know we, we do try to cast a, a fairly wide net. We try to you know keep a very very broad tent in what we do, and we've been very happy with the students that we've we've come in and kind of gone out into the uh, ranks of alumni, and led very successful feet careers in, in the areas of cybersecurity, both in government and in industry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was um, looking at the uh, uh, live Q&A uh, box and uh, a question for Dr. Wetzel came in, so I, I want to uh, relay this. And the question is, um, um, approximately how many students go into cyber research? So I guess to make this a bit more broad, do you think it, this is uh, there are already enough students? Uh, do you need more? How popular is, is the field as a field of study and research? OK, so in terms of how many students go into cybersecurity research, I don't think I, I do have any specific numbers, um, simply also because um, for cybersecurity research, I mean, we, we heard uh, all throughout the morning that cybersecurity is a very interdisciplinary field. So we may actually have cybersecurity research in math, in computer science, in engineering, in the business school, on the law side. And so it's very difficult to really pinpoint and say, this is the overall number of students in, in cybersecurity research. Um, I think we have a much better handle in terms of, you know, knowing numbers as far as students going into educational programs, um, say a bachelor's or a master's degree program. Now students really pursuing uh, a research and, and, and a research direction in terms of a PhD with a focus in cybersecurity overall, I think we do not have enough students to do that. I think there is a tremendous shortage. Um, we should have many more students doing that. And um, it would be wonderful if more students went into this into this uh, career path, so to say, or started the career path in research and at least pursued a graduate degree with a focus in research with a thesis on a master's degree level or with um, 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 a PhD and then really helping us build the next generation of researchers either for industry research or the academic career because we desperately need um, the next generation of, of professors to to teach the next generation of students and um, we have more positions to fill both in industry and in academia um, on the phd level so um, we don't have enough uh, there is a desperate shortage Okay, thank you. I think we ha still have time for another question, and uh, I think that's a question for uh, for Doc, uh, Dr. Dijkstra. 
And uh, this question says, um, uh, so I have a, an MBA as well in investigation law enforcement experience. Now, is uh, this already um, sufficient uh, to get started in cybersecurity? Or I, I guess uh, I want to also broaden the question a little bit. Uh, would it be helpful um, perhaps uh, to learn some of the professional certifications which are out there in addition to this, or, or maybe some other, other things you, you would recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, work experience is very valuable. It certainly counts for a lot. And I encounter in my life a lot of people with military experience uh, who might not have any degrees. And I don't just kick them out of my door, right? That is all valuable uh, in its own right. Now, if I'm going to hire you to do a programming job and you've never programmed before, that's probably not a good fit. It's not a good fit for you. It's not a good fit for me. But that's not that's kind of an extreme, right? I can teach if you can leverage your business experience or your law enforcement experience to do forensic work or over the next two years, I can sort of teach you the technical bits to do that. That might be a great fit. Certifications I have mixed feelings about. Um, it is difficult for any employer to measure somebody's skill in something, right? And so a, an academic degree, a certification is one way we use as proxies for do you know stuff? Um, it's imperfect, but it is something. Um, and some certifications are more respected and valuable than others. So the SAN certifications, for example, although they're quite expensive, um, it takes quite a bit of work and knowledge to demonstrate that as opposed to like a plus certification, which is relatively cursory um, or the CISSP, which is very, very broad, but very shallow, right? The CISSP, you have to know about a little bit about RSA encryption and a little bit about like security cameras and 10,000 other things. So the the if you're trying to break into a field, sure, a certification can show a little bit of knowledge that in part, if you're doing it on your own, right, it shows your sort of self motivation to do that. So to our projects, if you just have a side project uh, where you write open source software and contribute to GitHub or you volunteer with the Humane Society like to help with their website, like all of those things demonstrate to an employer not only your interest, but that you have a little bit of experience. Hopefully that helps. Thank you very much. And we have uh, reached the conclusion of our event. We have two uh, more exciting sessions ahead. I want to thank uh, Dr. Minimar, Dr. Wetzel, uh, Dr. Dijkstra, and Dr. Roloff for uh, your wonderful contributions today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.